guest today is the fabulous Miss Karen Rolfe. Um, Karen, um, gosh, we have been watching you. Like I remember our first introduction when we first saw you way back when coming in at a Pirelli event and you were on this spectacular white horse doing dressage. I believe it was bareback and bridalist. And could have been. <laughs> yeah. And it, we were just like, oh my God, look at this goddess. Um, and it's so incredible, right? Just to have that partnership. And since then, um, since we've moved to Florida, we've really gotten to know you a little bit better. And not only you are amazing horsewoman, you're also an incredible business person and a fabulous human being. Um, and so each time you and I kind of run into each other, I want to ask you some questions and we always go, oh, well, let's wait, let's wait, let's wait till we, you know, we're, we're, we can have other, we can be recorded so other people can get all of the yummy stuff that you're going to share with us. So here we are today. So welcome Yay. to the show. Thank you so much for having me. This is fun. You're welcome. Yes. Um, and, you know, I come in, like when I set these up, it really is to be able to introduce our audience or give a little bit deeper connection to our audience on the people that Brian and I have been so blessed to have part of our lives and part of our journey, um, because we feel that what we, uh, what other people, you know, like we're a whole together. And um, there's no one thing, you know, there's no one person that creates an entire journey. And, um, and so for me, it was more about um, being able to bring our community in and getting to share some of the great things that we are, I don't want to say privy to because everybody has privy to it in the world, but sometimes it's just creating the awareness and making the introductions. And I seem to be really good at that, making introductions. Yes. So um, the technical title for today is creating stronger partnerships with horses using healthy movements naturally. So I'm going to jump right in. I get the creating stronger partnerships with horses because that's kind of like what we're about. Um, using healthy movements naturally. Can you can you give us some insight on the using healthy movements naturally? Sure. It's it's kind of my favorite subject. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, I mean, where this came from was. Um, I originally, um, well, my professional, original profession was a dressage trainer, right? So I was really in the dressage world and very much into gymnastic development, you know, to the highest levels in dressage. And then I started to immerse in natural horsemanship and thinking more about the partnership that I originally had with my horse when I was a little crazy kid <laughs> playing with her horse. And by being in those two areas, I noticed that there was a little bit of a gap. Now, when I first started doing this, there was a big gap because there was sort of the partnership people over here, and the dressage people over here, and nobody talked to each other. So, you know, after having those two bodies of knowledge, I thought, gosh, there is this place in the middle that's so important. So people who were prioritizing partnership with their horse wanted to improve how their horse moved, but if they went to a normal dressage lesson, often it was too big a jump. It was too foreign. It, it, the dressage people had no idea about the kind of foundation they had with their horse. So the, the people who are prioritizing partnership um, weren't able to access the amazing science of gymnastically developing your horse. And of course, vice versa. So what I wanted to do was not only share that information across, but find the information that bridged it. And when you really think about what healthy movement is, things like balance and freedom of movement and alignment, like these things should feel good to a horse. <laughs> they should feel good to us riding them, but they should feel good to a horse. And the reason they feel good is because 
it's the healthiest way to go. Balance naturally feels good. Freedom of movement, you're free of brace and restriction and contraction. So if, you know, if I can become like my horse's favorite yoga teacher, like where you go into yoga and you feel better walking out than you did before you went into the class. So that's the bridge piece between the partnership and the dressage, because it's based on this premise of what I'm asking the horse to do will actually make the horse feel better at the end of it, where they go, thank you so much for having me do that weird stuff. I feel better. And that's the connection. That's, that's why by riding in a certain way can actually build the partnership because you're actually physically making the horse feel better. (laughs) Well, but isn't it like, yes, absolutely. And I, Brian and I are of the belief that anything that makes the horse feel better is going to strengthen that partnership. Exactly. Exactly. it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if it's just a scratch. It doesn't matter, you know, if it's lights, it doesn't, it does it doesn't matter if it's just, Hey, let's go on out to the pasture and I'm going to hand walk you out there. Cause you know, I want to be part of your herd. Um, but riding is a huge part of it. And I, and coming from the natural horsemanship world. And so, um, <clears throat> you know, Brian and I started out as trail riders and then, um, we quickly found ourselves into the natural horsemanship world because, you know, we thought our first horse should be a six month old Appaloosa cross. And so because of that, and cause I tend to be a little bit tenacious, we ended up in the natural horsemanship world. And so it's really just been in the past couple of years that I've really gotten like, Hey, I, you know, like one of the things that I don't think a lot of people know is Brian and I teach dance and, and it was a huge part of our life for like 15 years. We used to compete in, in couples dancing. We still teach it. And, um, like from a biomechanical perspective, you know, like, I'm like, okay, I have a, I like to think that I have a greater body awareness than maybe the average person does just because like from my dance background, like, you know, sometimes it's, you know, you, you have to put your body in places to get a particular look. And so when I started, you know, digging around and poking around and going, Oh, I, I want to learn dressage. I want to learn dressage. And then I'd go, well, where do I need, where do I need to be? Where do I need to be? I would get the, well, just go, you know, just keep trotting until your horse goes into a camp. And I'm like, well, okay, but my horse is 18. And I know from an equine body work perspective that all that's going to accomplish is um, breaking down the relationship, right? Exactly. Yeah. It's like, and that's, that's exactly the gap I was talking about. Like, where's the dance? Yeah. (laughs) Why does it feel like dance? And And in so much dressage now, it's changed a lot in the last 10, 20 years. But so much of dressage is like getting the horse to do stuff, right? you know, getting the horse to do this movement. Let's get him to do a shoulder and let's get, you know, and really to remember that the first premise is to create balance and alignment and freedom of movement and increase the quality of gait like that. Again, that should feel good to the horse. And then, you know, the more we help the horse enjoy it and it feels like a dance and it feels like a partnership and it feels like harmony and motion, you know, we have that just solidifies our partnership. And now we have a lot in the partnership bank and then, yeah, let's now go to the gym and see if we can get our horses to do more push-ups and pull-ups and physically demanding stuff, but we've got to have more in the partnership bank account. So it's partnership, not just on the ground, but also in movement. And you want to hear a fun fact on, I did not know that about you guys in the dancing I took ballroom dancing lessons for a while and I don't know this. I don't know if he's still out there doing this, but if anybody, here's a little bit of trivia. There's a psychic medium named John Edwards. He used to have some TV shows. Anyway, he was my ballroom dance instructor. Oh my God. Yeah. Cause when I met him, he was (laughs) still talking to dead people, but he hadn't like 
made it you know, he, he resistant. He didn't really want to be talking to dead people. They just kept talking to him. But anyway, so that's a little bit of trivia that I did. Oh see. my God. How fun is that? <laughs> how fun is, well, we, we attempted to retire from that when we, when we started our business 10 years ago, um, 11 years ago now, and um, we keep getting dragged out of retire, we dragged was, out of retire. It would be so fun though. I mean, I just was, a, I was like, a, to equate it to dressage, I was like a second, third level ballroom dancer, <laughs> but right? it was so fun. And it's so analogous to dressage. I mean, you know, as the woman, I was like, this is what it feels like to be a dressage horse. You know, you got to have a really good leader and yep. I have to like keep you in balance. And yeah, it was, I, I really enjoyed it. Yes. It's amazing. The number of people, um, you know, when we were really entrenched in the dance community um, back in the Midwest, <clears throat> excuse me, we've created, it's kind of like the natural horsemanship role. We just created some amazing friendship, like mm -hmm. incredible friendships that have transcended space and time. And um, so it's interesting because now there's a lot of us that, you know, when we were back in that heyday, if you will, a lot of us are now into horses um, as a matter of fact and, and dressage. So I, I just, you know, how interesting out of all of the, I don't wanna say hobbies in the world, but out of yeah. all of the hobbies in the world that those two. Um, so I think they really, yeah relate closely so Karen how like like the transition like how does you know like how does somebody go I'm gonna say because I think a lot of our my people that are listening are more on the natural natural horsemanship aspect of it anyways and they they really I think have a probably a greater comprehension of the um value of that that horse human partnership. So mm -hmm. I think the biggest thing for me and Brian for sure has been, how do we transition to that? Like, how do we make that transition into like the saddle? Like if you were giving me advice and I'm like, okay, Karen, all I know how to do is walk, kind of post a trot and do a little bit of canter. And all I've done is trail riding what is your, what is like, what would you say? What would you to transition into, into improving how your horse moves or into transition into what? Well, you know, for me, for quality of movement, quality of gait, okay. like, let's talk about that. Yeah. The, the quality of gait, it's really about, um, well, here's what I have my students do. I have them first visualize and, and I have them list or write down or say out loud the adjectives that you would like to feel while you're riding your horse. And Ooh. it doesn't have to be technical terms. You know, I've had students say, I want it to feel like whipped cream, like, okay, whipped cream. Like it doesn't have to be like engaged, collected, uh, you know, <laughs> doesn't have to be technical terms. Just, just kind of dream for a minute about the adjectives you'd like to feel from your horse. And then I pose the possibility that somewhere there's a certain combination for your horse on this day with you. That's a certain combination of relaxation, energy, and balance. Mm. That's it. Three things. So think of, um, you can I have a lot of analogies for this, but think of uh, colors on a palette. So you're an artist and you put down your primary colors, right? So you put some yellow, some red, some blue. From those primary colors, you can create any color you want, right? right? So relaxation, energy, and balance, your primary conversations. And if you mix those around in a certain combination, you'll get somewhere that goes, oh, that feels nice, right? And right. so if things don't feel nice with your horse or you know your, your adjectives are things like free and fluffy and whipped cream, and when you describe your actual horse, it's like jarring, stilted, crooked. <laughs> <laughs> then you go, okay, what do I do? Well, then you go, well, I must need to change something in the relaxation. Are there ways I could relax more? Maybe let's take a few deep breaths. How's my energy level? Is it too high or is it too low? Well, why don't we try going a little higher and try going a little lower and see how it feels? How about the balance? Am I crooked? I don't know. Maybe let's try 
asking those shoulders to move to the right or the left or the haunches to the right or left, or maybe I need to twist my body to the right or left. And you just start playing around, but you play around in a way that you go, hey, let's do some higher energy. And then you, you kind of sit there and go, how does that feel now? I don't know. Let's try lower energy. How does that feel now? And I have my students do this and tell me when it gets worse. So a lot of times students get a little paralyzed because they're like, is this right? I don't know. I'm not sure. But I promise you, everybody can play this game and you'll be able to tell me when it's worse. Everybody knows that. Well, tell me when the when your adjectives you're using to describe your horse get worse. <laughs> and so if you go really low energy until you're really clear that this is not what you want, shuffly, stumbling, <laughs> plopping, and then you try going high, <laughs> then you go high energy until you start feeling frantic, hectic, scared. <laughs> I go, okay, well, that's too high. And now you know what too high and too low is. And now it's got to be somewhere in the middle. So you just keep playing until you go, Oh, that feels better. And, and you see if you get closer to the original adjectives that you're choosing. So now you've got a range and you've achieved it, not with anybody telling you what looks good, but by playing around and feeling it. So you can play with each of those conversations separately. And that's what I recommend. One day go out and just think about relaxation. Can you relax deeper? Anytime, anywhere, can you get your horse to relax and just melt to a stop and just play around with that? See what happens. Then the next day you might go, hey, let's play with energy levels today and just see what I learn. And then the next day you might go, let me try wiggling body parts around. Let me move the shoulders over here for a step and then just sit quiet and see how it feels. See what you learn. You'll probably find one body part that moves really easily and one body part that doesn't move. And then you've learned something. And if you trust that you have those adjectives floating in your mind and you play around with those conversations, you will stumble across a moment that feels better. Or <laughs> you're going to realize that like, you can't talk to your horse about relaxing and you can't talk to your horse about energy and you can't move any body parts. And you go, okay, well, there I have my homework. <laughs> and you go back and, and get those conversations better. But this is where, you know, one of the things I teach is for students to trust their instincts. And when a student starts asking me, you know, does this look right? I go, how does it feel? And I really want the students to trust that they absolutely will know what feels better and what feels worse to them based on what adjectives they are looking for. And, and if as a student, you get better at going, I have an idea, let me play around. Oh, that's closer. Now I know the range I need to be in. That's so confidence building. And that's really all your horse cares about is you, your conversation with the horse. And probably the adjectives that you're looking for will also feel good to the horse. Cause I think whipped cream feels better than a uh, stumbly. <laughs> so your horse is probably, I, I, well, I'll put it this way in all the clinics I've taught all over the world. I've never had to modify somebody's adjectives and where I've said, no, you really shouldn't go for that adjective. The only time that I've done, well, the only time that I've maybe done that is if um, the footing changed, like it was, it rained and then the ground was slippery. And I might say, is that fair, reasonable, possible? And they're like, oh, wait, no, not today. <clears throat> but for the most part, yeah, every, it, I've never corrected anybody. They, they, if they say their adjectives and then they trust their instincts, they're, they're, they're going to get it. They're, I love that. That's, that's amazing um, to think about because like what feels good to me or what I want my adjective to be is going to be very different than my friend who breezes race. Exactly. Right? Exactly. So, and, and this is where people run into trouble because let's say you go to a dressage trainer and they have a picture of what they want their adjectives to be. And they get you and your horse to do this unbelievably high powered bouncy trot. So technically like that's better, but you now are losing your balance. You can't sit it. So you're bumping on their back and the horse is like, this sucks. Right. <laughs> Whereas if you said, okay, I just would like things to feel a little floatier or a little more 
you know, rhythmic and you went out on the trail and you just played with a little bit of different energy levels and maybe you played around with exactly where your body is, I'll bet you, you would find a place that you and your horse like better and you got there in harmony and it feels better because you can ride it. Like that's the place to start. And now you and your horse have not only found a better place to be that you're happy with, but you've now gotten very sophisticated about your communication. And if you practice that, then if you go to a dressage trainer that you trust and they say, Hey, Donna, you might want to see, you know, ask your horse for a little more energy. You and your horse are already practiced in this and you can, you can play that game. And so just going there and them trying to create the trot, that's going to win the national championships. And you're like, I don't care about that. I just want to right. Whatever your adjectives are, you know, right. Baby right. steps, baby steps. I love that. Um, yeah, yes. I, I had never heard of that in that perspective, but as you were explaining it, I was like, Oh, this could easily for somebody that maybe is recovering from an injury or maybe has a new horse or something like that. It's something that they could definitely play with even on the ground. I would think. Um, I mean, Absolutely. Yeah. And this is this, this moment that feels the best. This is what I call the sweet spot. So this is, you know, what I just described was my finding the sweet spot of healthy biomechanics protocol. And that moment that you're aiming for is unique to every horse and every moment and every day. So yeah, there's a horse that's um, recovering from tendon injuries. Well, he's actually recovered at this point, but um, he, you know, that sweet spot, those adjectives were different than they were before he injured. So it's like the sweet spot of, you know, his tendons aren't as loose as they used to be. And, and the strides a little shorter for now. And my sweet spot is, I just want it to be even. So there's no picture in a book that says that's the perfect one. It's it's the one that you want for that day. So when I go out with, um, with that horse, my, my adjectives are regular, consistent and balanced. And that looks different than how he did, you know, before the injury. But I, I think about, and I go, as long as I have him regular, consistent and balanced, now I know he's developing symmetrically and he's recovering symmetrically. And then we can expand on the range of motion, um, and so I find a, a certain energy and relaxation and balance where I can achieve that, that moment. So it's so important that every horse and rider are, and, and like you said, even on the ground are empowered to be able to achieve what they're aiming for. Right. And the conversation between you and the horse is so much more important than what some trainer tells you it should look like, <laughs> right. you know, right. once you guys get that you can find this together. Now you can go to a trainer and when they say, Hey, could you move your horse's shoulder over there? You go, Oh yeah, I've been practicing that already. <laughs> you know? right. uh, but people underestimate what they can do on their own, given the permission and given the concept and, and the ability to go ahead and trust their instincts and talk to their horse. Yeah. I love that. I love the, the thing with the instincts, you know, we get that a lot like when we'll have we have people that you know well how long should I leave the light on how you know how long what what does this mean what does that mean and you know we give our answer well it depends and it depends every every horse is different there's some horses that I can hold the light you know five inches away and have it on for 10 seconds and that's enough for them I have other horses that are, you know, I call them energy hounds, you know, like we can keep the lights on for 10 minutes in one spot and they're like, give me more. And mm -hmm. so as much as, you know, there's that balance of being scientific and natural, right? And so, um, you know, it's so important that I love how it just translates right into the other aspects of horse mm -hmm. as well not just, you know, like as a natural healer, you know, but really having those um, energetic conversations with your horse, even under saddle. Yeah. And, you know, and that's, I love that you said that because, you know, somebody the other day asked me like, why is it called dressage naturally? And my, the answer is, you know, I did natural horsemanship and dressage. So I put it together. 
very clever, but the more, <laughs> you know, the more I do it, I'm like, no, the natural part is actually this, what we're talking about. It's the being natural. It's not judging and saying, what should I do? What did someone say? It's, it's the feeling in the moment. It's being natural and naturally connected. And in this moment, and I think with the stuff you're talking about, Donna, like, does the horse need more or do I need to hold it away from him? I think if we, you know, it all comes down to being in this moment and really feeling what's going on, because that's, that's when you can read what the horse is telling you, or at least take a better guess, you know, because you, you, you know, I find that I just, you know, it, I don't even know how to describe it is not a message or whatever, but I, I just seem to have different decisions when I'm really in the moment right. and being natural than when I'm following the plan. <laughs> you know, I mean, a plan is a good place to start to have like kind of a framework, a structure, like, right. You know, here's the basic map, <laughs> Right. You know, but even, you know, it's kind of like, you know, when you get directions from someone, you go, and then a half a mile, take the exit. Well, the exit's actually half a mile plus 20 yards, <laughs> but you don't just go, well, I hit half a mile. <laughs> I'm going to turn, you know, you, you go, okay, I'm in the vicinity and now I'm going to feel the moment and make sure I turn exactly where that ramp is. And, and that's the, how do we, how do we drop into those moments? And I think it's just I don't know, being in the moment and really feeling the energy. I mean, what you do is the same thing. It's like feeling what the horse needs. Right. Right. And, and I'm going to, I'm going to kind of let in on a little secret. Um, Brian and I, when Brian and I go work on horses, a lot of, you know, Brian's the mechanical engineer. He's very, you know, he's just wired left brain, very methodical, very dot, 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 dot. And so the way that he approaches a horse is completely different than the way that I do. And, you know, so people go, well, what point should I put it on or what? And I'm like, I just, whatever the horse shows me that day, like I, I, you know, I can walk into a horse's energy and the horse, you know, like shows me where it, it needs work. And, yeah. and yeah, and, I think we need both, right? You guys yeah. are a perfect couple. Cause we need a little structure. <laughs> A little Correct. direction. Correct. Correct. To get us in the, you know, we're in the ballpark. But then yeah, I think there's a lot of Yeah. Room and to this drop is kind in. of the same thing, right? And when you were explaining the, you know, putting the dressage and the naturally together because you came from two different worlds. Um, the image that came to mind, Karen, we uh recently got a load of three Andalusians on our farm. I know. Fun. They're amazing. Anyways, I, I could talk for hours on them, but I'm not going to. Um, but really what struck me when you said the dressage naturally was, um, you know, we let them out into our pasture and got to watch them. You know, they had been in quarantine for a week. And so they were, you know, had lots of energy and just needed to kind of burn some steam off. And of course, you know, you watch them play. And, you know, you know, they do th three flying lead changes in a row and, you know, keep on going. And so to me, like what the dressage naturally means is, can I be a pass? I don't want to say a passenger on the back, but can I be a part an active dance partner where the horse is allowed the freedom of that movement with me being the partner on yeah. top? Yeah. And that, I think for like, for me, I, you know, that's kind of like the image that I conjured up. Yeah. yeah it's this game of leading and following, right? So yeah. Yeah. Um, we want to lead our horses and give them some suggestions. We also need to follow them. And, and right. once we, you know, in, if, even if they're doing what we ask, now we have to follow them. Right. And then sometimes they have good ideas and, and we just follow follow them first. And then that's how we achieve the harmony. And then we can lead from there. But in every moment, there's this little magic blending of leading and following. Right. And, uh, and there's, there's kind of cool moments where you're feeling really amazing stuff. And in that moment, you don't know, like, am I leading this? Is this my idea or his idea? Right. And that's where the real magic happens. Cause you're both sharing something right. that neither of you can do on your own. <laughs> right. Well, yeah. 
And, you know, from a dancing perspective, um, you know, a leader has a very different job than a follower does. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, you know, um, I'm going to throw us women under the bus a little bit because, you know, we've taught thousands of people to dance. Um, You know, us women always want to take charge and try to back lead the guys, but really it's when the leader has his job and the follower follower understands their job, they're two completely different things. Mm -hmm. And so um, we always had um, our long-term students learn both roles because they are so completely, completely different. Mm -hmm. And it takes a completely different psyche, you know, like as a follower, all we have to do is just kind of feel where the contact is and just go, you know, go where the contact takes us. And we don't have to think about it. We don't have to think about anything. Um, Whereas the leader has to be, you know, three steps ahead going, okay, what am I going to do now? And what is the music saying? And what is the music asking me to do? And what, and, and then there's also the feel of the music because each song has a different feeling. So it's, you know, when it comes together, it's that beautiful picture that everybody goes, yes, I want to learn how to dance because it's so magical. Yeah. Yeah. Yay. Um, now it was within the movement. And so I, 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 so now I've painted up, so I've gone out, I've done these little exercises, which I love. Um, I'm going to go play with that. So then what would be the next step? Well, now you're in that sweet spot. Now that sweet spot can be done online at Liberty, riding bridalists, riding with a bridle, with a bit, and it can be done with or without connection in the reins. So the next step then, if you have this ability to find this posture that's let loose and the horse is free and balanced, and then, then I like to think about the, the contact and connection. And f- for me, to use the dance analogy, um, you know, riding in connection with the reins is like dancing the waltz, you know, it's connected. It's not like doing, you know, the salsa, you know, where you like, you send the woman out and they like do stuff and then they come back in and, you know, there's some, they're always connected, but sometimes not as much, but where the waltz and the foxtrot, you're really connected. So that's the final picture of dressage is much more like that. So, um, just like with dancing. I remember when we took dancing, we all stood in a line and did the steps. And then we stood facing each other and did the steps. Then we touched and did the steps. And then we did the arms. And often when the arms came in, that's when (laughs) the wrestling began. Uh, So that's where, that's where everything fell apart. Yes. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So have the it's a good way to, you guys didn't get a divorce through it. So good on you, you know? So yeah, it's, is a challenge. So Introducing the connection with the reins, I feel once you have um, two individually balanced in self-carriage independent bodies, it's much easier now to create the connection with the reins. So, um, and I teach that the purpose, the reins only have three purposes. So one is subtle positioning of the head and the neck. And I mean, very subtle because bridal is, I can still position, I can still influence the neck. So we just need, reins are really good for refined, subtle communication. Another purpose of the reins is um, to, f- to receive information. So you can go along with no reins and things can feel pretty good. Then you shorten your reins and you're like, oh, all of a sudden I feel more pressure in my left rein, but not my right. And how come my arms are now doing weird things? So you're getting information about a deeper level of, of stuff, crookedness or blocks or you know, whatever's going on, you'll feel it in the reins. You'll feel any problem in the horse's body in the reins. And then the third purpose of the reins is just another point of connection to create that all is one kind of feeling. So I ask when people are using their reins, I usually ask them, okay, now, if you know that those are the three purposes of the reins, what are you actually using your reins for? Speed control, turning, stopping, 
balancing, balancing, you know, and then, so then I go, okay, well now we have to eliminate all those reasons for using the rain. So the, all we're left with is holding hands with our horse. So that's the kind of next layer. But if, if we don't go through the finding the sweet spot process, then you're taking two unbalanced, you know, bodies who aren't, you know, who are shuffly and crooked and frantic or whatever those adjectives are that we don't want, try to connect those two things together. It's, it's a recipe for, for problems. So I like to, you know, with a good foundation where you have a happy little camper horse, and now you've um, played with each of your bodies so that, you know, you're in the best sweet spot possible. Now let's come together and have that dance partner connection, start dancing the waltz. Dance, start dancing. Yes. It's so, so important. Like, so, so important. And, you know, balance and like you said, self-carriage, that's uh, incredibly important in, in dancing, but also I think, you know, like with being on top of the horse. Yeah. And self-carriage when you have the reins is actually harder the best way to not lean on your reins is to take the reins off. Right. So, you know, go bridalist. You will have no problems in your contact. <laughs> <laughs> but when you, so, so actually the next, there's a little bridge moment. So um, a lot of times I teach people who come from a, a more natural foundation and they're actually very comfortable riding without reins. So the next step is I say, just take the slack out of the reins but don't ask anything. Just make sure you can take the slack out of the reins, know where each other are, but have nothing change. Right. Nothing. <laughs> doesn't have to get round, doesn't have to, but just notice what happens when you pick up and put down the reins. And if, if you get past that stage and nothing negative happens, now, now we can maybe start to really connect and influence and um, think about the posture and potential energy and, you know, bending and shaping, you know, in a little bit more um, refined way. But if the, if the horse is generally balanced and free and aligned, and then you take the slack out of the reins, often they're already in the posture that the beginnings of dressage is trying to, you know, make happen with a lot of inside leg, outside rein, half all. Right, right. Just balance like the bodies new, and now shorten your It's a whole new language, by the way. <laughs> it's just yeah. like, okay. I, I know, know there's somebody out here who's taken a dressage lesson, maybe. <laughs> right, right, exactly, exactly. Um, how often do you actually find a horse that is completely balanced? Naturally completely balanced? Uh, I mean, they, it, it I have to decide which brain I'm using. Cause you know, I always have the picture of a Grand Prix horse, horse and not, no, no, not horse. no horse is <laughs> going with that kind of balance, you know, cause it's, ba yeah. there's balance and then there's balanced enough to do 15, one tempies or counter change the hand. So, but a natural balance where you can get on and go from point A to point B and close your eyes and not feel like you're going to like fall over. <laughs> There, there's a fair amount of horses. So I think there's a range. I think what I'm trying to say is there's a range. Yeah, there's yeah. some horses where it's like, whoa, right. <laughs> like you're just veering off. Like you got the shopping cart with the wobbly wheel. Um, right. But, and as, I think especially I'll say it, there's a higher percentage of horses with a good natural balance since I've done, started my horses in a more natural horsemanship way. Yeah. Because I'm not dealing with horses that are scared or not trusting or their minds are not focused on my focus. on Because I teach focus on the line of travel and self-carriage and so many of the things that throw horses off balance. Uh, and I'm riding them with a halter and no reins. So a lot of the sources of imbalance um, are taken care of very early on right. in the more natural start. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it I'm, makes it, it makes a huge difference. Like we, the, the Andalusians that just came in, um, they were born and bred and all started, um, you know, and they're at their second training, training second level, um, you know, by a natural horsemanship person who, but who was also a dressage person in their own right as well. And um, I have, I have actually ridden the one. Um, it makes a huge. There's not. They're clean. Like it's yeah. hard. 
like it's hard to describe, you know, like when Brian and I were feeding, you know, because we, we, you know, we had to rearrange everything and, um, you know, I've got, I've got these two fabulous horses now and they're like, oh, hey, and they're want, they're looking like I walk out the door and they're like, hi, let's connect. Oh, you want to yeah. play a liberty through the fence? Okay. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's so incredible to describe yeah. how different that is if you're fortunate, you know. Yeah. Be, and and with that. any, yeah. And with any horse that you have, um, you can sit down and go, okay, why aren't they balanced? And this is another exercise I do in clinics. I'll like have a big dry erase board. Okay. Let's name all the reasons why our horses are not all the positive adjectives we just listed. So I have them list the adjectives they want. And then I could now think of your horse as they are and what could be the reason. And we just as a group list, and there's a long list of why your horse might not be balanced. Right. So but if we, they often go into categories, you know, equipment, the fit of the tack, fear or imbalance of the rider, or, you know, go on and on. And then, so you can just look then at your horse and go, why might they be unbalanced? Oh, well, they're unbalanced because I'm always having to hold the left rein. Why? Because they're always trying to fall in on the left shoulder. Oh, okay. Well, then that's just a left shoulder thing. It's not a contact thing. And a, it's just this one little thing. So if you can start to get specific, and this is again, where you don't have to have a lot of education, trust your instincts, just go, why is my horse unbalanced? And what would I need to feel? What would I need to be different in order to be more balanced? Right. And most students, even if they don't have a high education with horses or dressage can get really in the ballpark. And then if you get in the ballpark and then you, you just trace it back, it's like, well, like I said, like, okay, they're up. My horse is always pulling on my reins and then I lose my balance and blah, blah, blah. It's like, okay, well, what happens if you stop pulling? Well, then they go too fast. Okay. Well, why is he going too fast? Because blah, blah, blah. And they just kind of trace it back and they go, okay, let's find one little exercise that can prove that one little piece. Um, so it's a lot of eliminating the reasons why they're not all naturally in balance. And if you remove the things that are getting in the way, then right. you're left with a cleaner, a cleaner slate. But so many people try to add on exercises to try to fix the problem instead yeah. of getting rid of the reasons why the problem's there in well, the I first love, place. I love, I love, I love that. Mm -hmm. I absolutely love that. So I know you have like, I, um, I know you have a program, an online program, and um, I know that you're very generous in your program. I know you give a lot away. Um, you also have an introductory, like I've, I've seen it. And I also know that it's incredibly reasonably priced on a monthly basis. Um, what could I expect? So I, so are there exercises specific? Like if I get specific and go, okay, my horse is pulling on, we're having shoulder problems. And of course we're doing body work and other things like that. So we maybe, it might be, you know, like, would there be something in your library that would be able to um, help me address that or give me a picture? Because like for, you know, for me, it go, I get to watch all of my friends ride dressage and it's great and it's beautiful, but it's not like I can see from the inside, like what they're doing in their body, right? Yeah. Like there's no x-ray, at least not yet, like an x-ray vision or yeah. what it, like what that looks like or how the how-to aspect of it. So is there something in there yeah, I got a video or two. No. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I do. I, was, I have. I was like, I well, a... I think you've got like thousands of videos. <laughs> yeah, I got a lot of stuff. So yeah, there's got a lot, lot of, and and probably where people get a little confused is like which one to start with. So you know, right. I have a lot of stuff. I have. Um, let me. So I'll point you to what I think is my recommendation. So I have um, a video classroom. It's got over 400 videos, and it has videos in categories from foundation partnership through biomechanics, like finding the sweet spot, like I talked about, connection with the reins, 
gymnastic development has the whole shebang, a lot of mindset stuff. We have guests, like we have a video with you and Brian um, doing the red light therapy on one of my horses. So we have a real range and we do a, a one week free trial and then it's $29 a month after that. Yep. So that's the best place. Cause if you go there, it's called the video classroom and I can tell you how to find it, but you can f- do the one week trial. And then for one week you can poke around and look at videos on all different subjects and see if it, you know, is something that resonates with you. Right. And we have a Facebook group that goes with it. So a lot of people use that. Um, they'll go in there and go, Hey, I'm looking for videos on whatever subject. Here's the issue with my horse. And then you'll get a whole bunch of people including myself and my instructors um, pointing you to the, the video you want. So that's the easiest, least expensive, you know, way to get in there for free for a week and just check it out. Check it out. Yeah. Awesome. And then we also have some really step-by-step hand holding and, and actually um, in September now is when we, we have one course that opens up twice a year and September now is one of those times. Um, so that's like a real step-by-step weekly live Q and A's private video coaching, that sort of thing. Um, If you jump into the video classroom, you'll be getting some emails and we'll talk to you about the other course if you want. Um, But if you don't want, if you want to just stick your toes in the water, the video classroom really is um, the best way to go. Um, at the beginning, before we really officially got started, we talked about time and it's already, we've already been chatting. I could talk about this forever. <laughs> I know. I'm like, oh my God, we didn't even get to I know, talk I didn't about even look at the clock. And that's what I've been, my burning question. <laughs> I am, I, but, but you sort of answered it. Like you sort of answered it, you know, like, you know, the, but you talked about it more from the reins, you know, perspective. Um, What's the burning question? Well, just the, the, the bidding, you know, like, um, Oh, bits like, yeah. Bits. Okay. I, I start all my horses bitless. And so that I know what they're like without a bit. And then they all get introduced to the bit and they get to pick what bit they like. I usually start with some version of a snapple, but they get to, they get to choose. And I, since I know what my horse is like without a bit, then I know how they change when they do have a bit in their mouth. And sometimes I'm very surprised at what horses like and don't like. Um, and then I, so if, then if I feel like the bit is going to be a positive tool, something that's, it's a tool of refinement. So something that takes something that's working and makes it work better. If that horse um, with that horse, the bit seems like a positive tool of refinement that makes things better, then we continue on using it. But I have a couple of horses that are like, I hate snaffles, bleh, and they get worse. And I could spend years playing with snaffles and trying to find the one and it feels like a handicap. And so then they don't have to wear a bit. Um, so that's my view on bits. And one thing that people can do when you try to figure out what bit to try, uh, this is fun. Go to your local tack shop and go to the snaffle bit section And you take your arm, your forearm, and I just lay the bit over the fleshy part of my forearm. So the rings are down here and then just put a little pressure, see what it feels like. I've done that once. I put a bit over here and then I pulled down on the rings and I got a blood blister instantly. But you'll be amazed at how different the shape of the bit can feel on that fleshy part of your arm. Oh my God. So that's a fun, that's a fun little game to play. Um, so I, I have a, a bucket full of bits that are all kind of in the, they pass the comfortable to me or at least not uncomfortable. And then, like I said, the horse just, they, we play wear the bit and the one that they seem the most comfortable in, that's the one they get. Oh, well, there you, there you go. That, there's, that's there's awesome. bits in a nutshell. Is that enough? <laughs> Yeah, well, perfect, perfect, perfect. Okay. I mean, because we've now been into horses, you know, my Appaloosa is now 25 years old. So oh. um, I know. Um, uh, so, you know, we've been around, we've been around for a while now, and I've just never heard of that ever. And um, mm-hmm. we've, I've been getting quite the education in bits lately, um, okay. because of uh, my two younger horses. And, um, you know, the other thing is the length of the bit. Yeah. 
the length of the bit. And so I've got two saddle breads and they have got, oh my God, the tiniest mouth, like I think a four, a four in the quarter. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Quarter, right. And so then we get these Andalusians in and, um, you know, I have a light draft. So I'm like, well, I'll just use her snaffle. Right. Uh-huh. It's not, it's not long enough. <laughs> I, I had to go buy longer, like longer bits for these yeah, guys. Yeah. So I, it's just little things that, you know, just even having a basic. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the, the comfort test is fun. And then, you know, there's different, everybody has a little different thing. I like to just put it in and then just gently put pressure on one side and, and, you know, don't pull it, but just, just till it, you get That's resistance cool. and like a half inch. That's the sort of gets in the ballpark but some horses have really poofy lips <laughs> right and they need a little more room and right. some horses really don't like it to move and flop around and they want it to sit like just a little quieter in there yeah. um and then as far as how high or how low right in dressage the land it used to be two wrinkles i'm like so i don't really do two wrinkles anymore but some horses mouths are very short and if you put it too low, it starts clanking on their teeth. Other horses like it a little low. They like to hold it with their tongue. I mean, there's so much variety. I mean, think of it, it's a mouth. It's a pretty right. sensitive area, pretty right. personal area. So, right. you know, I do the, you know, just, just up to where it touches the lips, half okay. inch, you know, if I pull it on one side, watch how the horse reacts. And then I adjust up or down or bigger, or smaller or different shape mouthpiece from there. Awesome. Yeah. Yay. Yay. Well, thank you for that. Uh, you're welcome. Appreciate that. So, um, Lenchen has a question. Um, okay. She says, "Do you have?" And and I, you kind of answered. You kind of answered this um, a while back, but I just wanted to bring it up. And if anybody else has any questions, if you guys would like to just pop it in the chat, and then I can go ahead and ask Karen it for you guys. That would be wonderful. Um, do you have any exercises to help a horse who canters very heavy on the mm-hmm. forehand so that they can carry their weight in a more balanced way? Sure. Sure. Yeah, definitely. And there's kind of two ways my brain approaches this. Um, one would be, um, to, to make sure that, that there's, you know, this, take the basic things and make them even better. So how's the steering? How's the stopping? How's the line of travel, right? So I get very particular about following a line of travel, you know, on the long side, stop in the corner or being able to make a circle between cones. And I don't need my reins because when they commit their mind and their feet to something, then often balance issues start to improve right there. So I just make sure that the, sort of the foundational, are you going where I want to go at the speed I want to go <laughs> from a very basic foundational level is addressed. Then from um, also in the foundational bucket, you know, I'll, I can do exercises that require a little more um, responsibility for their own balance. So you can set up uh I'll set up like a, what I call a jumpless jumper course. So I'll put pairs of cones or standards or barrels around the arena. And the game I play is if you get rolling and plopping on the forehand, then I'm going to ask you to make a little bit sharper turn. That's going to require that you have to lighten up. So it's a little bit of a challenge. I go, Oh, could you do this turn? And they're like, Nope, I can't I'm plopping on the forehand. And so I try to get my communication and my motivation high enough. So they're like, I'm going to give that a try because you asked. And then they have to, the only way to solve the puzzle and be successful and make the turn is by being a little more athletic. So it's a little, you have, and then you have to find a turn that's sharp enough that they have to change how they're carrying themselves, but not so sharp. It's impossible. And right. so you kind of play this game, but I, I make these, I have lots of, um, opportunity. So if they get rolling along or just heavy, I might look over there and go, we're going to go to that one. <laughs> and it also helps because I then, you know, causes me to focus and me to have a real deadline. So that's, those are two foundational kind of ways where I use um, a mind exercise 
right. where they have to listen and get something done just because I asked, but I'm not manipulating their bodies at all, where they will correct their bodies. Right. So that's a sort of foundational way of addressing it. Uh, then from a more gymnastic way, I would say whatever I want at the canter, because a canter is the, the harder gate to change. The trot's the easiest gate to change. You can have a horse with a really mediocre trot and there's lots of room for improvement. A horse's canter is not as easy to change and it's easier to throw them off balance and have them drop out of the canter or something like that. So what I do is I ask myself, what am I feeling at the canter that I'd like to change? And then I really get good at changing that at the walk and the trot, like really good. So, you know, if they're flopping on the forehand at the walk or the trot, maybe it's, it's not so bad, but that same degree of on the forehand of the canter is worse because the canter naturally by the nature of the gate has a moment where they're leading front leg is on the ground and all the other legs are up. <laughs> so the same degree of on the forehand is actually worse at the canter. So I'll try to improve what I'm doing at the walk and the trot to a higher degree. So get very particular um, and doing transitions and, you know, lateral work and things like that. So I'll give you the, the concept and hopefully then you can apply it to your exact state. And then I try to get the very best version of my walker trot in that moment where I'm like, Ooh, this feels really nice and light, then do a transition to canter. And as soon as you feel like you're starting to lose it, go back to the walker trot and try to set a land speed record for getting light on the forehand at the walk and the trot. And by being as best as you can be before the canter and really good at recovering from the canter, the canter itself will start to improve without actually having to manipulate the canter. So that's my, I hope you wrote that down. <laughs> Cause that was, a, that was a lot. <laughs> it's being recorded. Yay. <laughs> no, that was a lot. So yeah, re rewind the tape with right, that. Cause there's, I, yeah, go, go back and listen to that. Cause there's a lot of stuff in there. And then, you know, and then if you're looking for like, huh, what do you actually mean by that? Well, there's videos in the video classroom for that. So, yeah. but that's the concept. So hopefully you'll be able to run with that. Lynchin is the one that answer, or asked the question, and yeah. uh, she is an awesome horsewoman. Um, and so I know that she got like she got. got that. That. I also okay, know that there's good. a lot of awesome horse women or horse people here too. So I'm sure that she's not the only one that just yeah. Does it. It's a really common the canner canners are because canners are just harder to to change. Yeah. Um, than trots. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, you know. Two saddle, two saddle reds in training for dressage. Canter is not their strong suit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's Canter good. is not their strong suit. That's it's, <laughs> they. They're the best teachers ever, right? <laughs> they're the best teachers. Um, Karen, oh my God, it's been an hour, um, and this has been so incredible. You have given us a ton of gold like an absolute ton of gold. Thank you so much for your absolute generosity with sharing um, these insights and tips and everything, you know, with my people. I so appreciate it. No, it's a, it's my pleasure. It's super yeah. fun. I love, and I love what you do. And I do my red light all the time and, yeah. you know, we're doing the same thing. We're trying to remove the blocks, right? Yeah. We're trying to remove the rocks from the river and just let the, the natural freedom and energy flow. We really do the same thing. So it's so complimentary. Right. Um, yours just happens to aesthetically look prettier. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, uh, uh, at, at so. least it's not like watching paint dry, um, you know, <laughs> but that's okay. Cause Brian and I love that, you know, like it's our, it's our, it's our thing. So uh, yeah. I, what we're going to do um, for, for everybody, um, this is being recorded. We are going to send it out to you guys in emails or so take a look for your email Karen will also go ahead and put your website on there so that for anybody that would be interested in taking a look at your awesome online program and um, have access to all of your incredible knowledge in videos mm -hmm. um, that they can really easily find you there and 
That's um, awesome. Yeah. If dressage naturally net, you can, there's a ton of stuff. If you have trouble finding anything, just go to the contact us page and shoot us an email or we'll help you find it. Cause there's, yeah, there's a lot of stuff on there. All there, good. Yes. Yes. A, amazing database. Um, amazing horsewoman, amazing human. Um, thank you so much. This was, I hope you had fun. I had a great time. I learned a lot. I'm excited to go out and play with my horses. Yeah. Go find that sweet spot. (laughs) And find that sweet spot and, and, and get my adjectives all in a row and whatnot. (laughs) So, um, thank you everybody for joining us and, um, please, uh, take a minute at least to go um, at least thank Karen. On oh, we're see- I'm seeing some thank yous. I found my way to the chat box there. <laughs> yes, yes, awesome. yes, yes. And um, Karen, we'll see you somewhere in Ocala. Sounds good. Thank All you right. so much. Thanks. Bye, Bye everybody.